why this lesson is important from James, why it was important to James when he wrote it, and why it's important to us in the 21st century, is you must never put yourself under the Mosaic Law system. We are New Covenant Church Age believers. When Christ came and died on that cross, he fulfilled he, he fulfilled all of that covenant. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, Matthew 5 says. Paul says, as a result of that, in Romans 10, 4, the Christ has brought an end to the law. Christ is the end of the law. Now, here's why you shouldn't put yourself under the law besides the most important thing that I just mentioned, is because if you put yourself under any aspect of the law and fail in one aspect of law, you're guilty of the entire law. See, that's James' point in James 2.10. So let's take a look at James 2, 9, 10, and 11 today. In 9, he says, and what he's been talking about is the sin of partiality. In James 2.9, he's been talking about the sin of partiality. That's the sin of prejudice, bias, partiality. He says, if you show partiality, and they had, they had made partiality, they were under the sin of partiality, and he illustrated in the first eight verses. By visitors who come, they set some of the visitors in certain selective places and set other visitors in... Uh, at the feet of other people and maybe on the floor, even though there were seats to be seated. And so James is talking about that. You can go back and read that later. In verse 9, if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Verse 10 says, here's what you need to really know about putting yourself under the Mosaic Law system. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one has become guilty of all. That's a pretty tough system, isn't it? Why was the, why was the Mosaic Law system so tough? Because it was designed, according to Paul in Galatians 3.24, to point you to Jesus Christ, who was the Savior. Because the law condemns you. You could never keep the law. There was only one person that was ever able to keep the law perfectly, and he was the son of God himself. The law was never intended to forgive you of your sins. It was never intended to give you salvation. It was never intended to take you to heaven. It was to point you to Christ, who was the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That's the purpose of the Mosaic Law. Never put yourself under it because the law of transgressor, the formula is, the legal formula, if you commit yourself to go under the Mosaic Law and commit one, you're guilty of committing them all. You violated all of the law, the whole law. Now think about it. Is that not tough? Now that's what James just said. James just said that in verse 10. In verse 11, he illustrates it. Now, they're guilty of the sin of partiality. Listen to what he compares it to in guilty of all. He said, for he who does not commit adultery and said, uh, for, uh, verse 11, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now, if you commit adultery, but, but if you do not commit adultery, but commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. If you violate one, you're guilty of the whole law. Here's how we would say it today. They throw the book at you. They throw the book at you. The whole Levitical system is thrown at you. If you violate one. Now, they, they called, they said, you've committed a, a sin of partiality. You say, well, what could the sin of partiality, what violation was it? It was a violation of the royal law of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. 
Deuteronomy 6, 5, you're to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's called the royal love. And Jesus said on these two commandments, hang the entire law and the prophets. The whole law and the prophets hang on this. The law condemns you, and the prophet says the answer is Jesus Christ. The law condemns you. That's why this is under the whole deal. The law condemns you. The messianic prophecies release you. That's how that worked. Have I had prayer? Okay. I can feel my engine starting to run. Let's, let's pause here. I've done my introduction. L let's pause and have a word of prayer. Remember this. Look up here a moment. The Bible it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. This Bible only makes sense to somebody who's been born again. You must be born again. It's a dead book for dead people. They, they don't get any more out of it than anything. But for us who are alive and will always be alive because of eternal life, this book is our guide on. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You cannot study it in carnality. You can't, you can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It shuts down the spiritual system of walking in the spirit, walking by faith. It shuts that whole system down. Personal sin does. It doesn't mean you have to be saved again. It means you have to deal with your sin in your life. How do I do it? I confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from that sin. You know, you know what cleansing from sin means? Hebrews 10, 17. God remembers your sin no more. Now think about that. The moment you as a believer confess your sin, he remembers that sin no more. You know why? Because confession involves cleansing. Cleansing involves the blood of Jesus Christ. What will wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and therefore, your, God always looks at you under the cleansing work of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why confession. And f confession is, is very important to your relationship with God as a spiritual person. When you confess it, it puts you back into the relation of the indwelling Holy Spirit who is the champion of your life. Your sin nature is not the champion of your life. It makes a slave out of you. But the Holy Spirit of God releases you from the lust of the flesh and puts you back in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the dynamics of the Christian life is. Listen, the dynamics of the Christian church is not going to church. It's becoming the church when you leave it. The church is the body of Christ. Going to church is not what does it. It's becoming the church when you leave it. That's what we're after. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into a morning study. Our Father, we bring to you our, our good sense about spirituality, evidence of carnality, personal sin, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, like the sin of partiality. What do we do with it? We confess it according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, you're faithful and just. What a wonderful promise to forgive us and cleanse us. How much forgiveness? Far as the east is from the west. I remember it no more. Oh, Father, what a wonderful thing that Christ has provided for us in that. I pray as we bow our heads and our hearts to you today and humble ourselves before the throne of grace that we would confess our sins and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth that we need to live by. We're a troubled nation today in, in almost every aspect because we have forsaken the power of the life in Christ. The power of the life in Christ. We think that we can make it in this world without obedience to Christ. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Instruct our hearts. Encourage us, Father, to live the Christian life in our everyday living, not just once a week. In Jesus' name, amen. In the third paragraph... In the third paragraph, hey, can I tell you about the law of transgression? 
listen to me now. There are no big ones and no little ones. There are no big laws and little laws. Under the law of transgression, if you violate one, you're guilty of what? All. Now think about that. There's nobody could do that. If you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. That's a per powerful system. You must never live on it. See, we think there are big ones and little ones. Just like people think there are big sins and little sins. There's no such thing. Christ didn't die for the big ones and not for the little ones. Christ died for sin. There are no big and little ones. There are no big laws and little laws. If you think the sin of partiality didn't carry the same weight as any other law, murder and adultery... He compared, he said the sin of partiality carries the same guilt as adultery and murder. Now, you would never suspect that because you don't pay attention to the law of transgression. I'm in James 2, 9 through 11. Jesus said it. He was quizzed on what is the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? He answered in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, he said, the greatest commandment is this. And he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 5, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And he said, the second one is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the key word in both of them is called the royal law of love. When you love God with all of your heart, soul, and all of your being, then you understand what the love of God means to you, and then you take that and give that to your neighbor unconditionally. That's what Jesus called the royal law. That was his law. And listen to what he said. He said, on these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. The law condemns you. The prophets tell you Christ is the answer. That's why he used that. The law condemns you, Galatians 3.24, the law condemns you. Nobody but nobody can keep the whole law, and if you violate one according to James 2.10, you're guilty of the whole law. You say, that's pretty tough. Yeah, why would you put yourself under the Mosaic law? You could never keep it, and if you violated one, you'd be guilty of all. It's a crazy, and listen, the Christians today put themselves under all kinds of Mosaic law. They put under the tithing system, the Sabbath system, the, the dietary system. They put themselves under so much of the Mosaic law and don't understand the guilt that comes from violation of any one. There are no big laws and no little. Don't think the Ten Commandments are the big ones and the other ones are the little ones. There's no such thing. There's no big sins. There's no little sins. There's no big laws. There's no little laws. You can't pick and choose what you want. When you put yourself under the Mosaic system, you're under the system. You don't get a chance to pick and choose. You think you do, but you don't. You don't pay attention to the Word of God. So, James is trying to show us that. James is trying to correct a lifestyle that it should be not Old Covenant lifestyle. You've been born again. Jesus Christ came into the world, died on a cross, was buried on the third day, raised from the dead to give you everlasting life. We're under a new covenant. We're not under the old covenant. Not one bit of it. But when you put yourself under any aspect of it, you are now hold up responsible for the whole system. Do you not understand that? Jesus said it. James said it. Paul said it. Listen to what Paul said. In Romans the 13, chapter 8 through 10. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. That's the royal law. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 8. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
That's the royal law. That's the law that you and I are under. We're not under the Mosaic law. Not one aspect of it. Don't put yourself under it. It's a law you can't keep. It's a law that condemns you and tells you to go get saved. But you're already saved, so why would you put yourself under a law that binds you? It's crazy. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen in the Christian church today. People binding themselves by the law that they can't keep, never could keep it, never will keep it. Listen, you know how the law is fulfilled? By the love of God working in your soul to you and out of your soul to others. That's what Paul said. Oh, no man, anything to love one another. Love fulfills the law. And then he tells you what law he's talking about. He's talking about the Mosaic. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. You know what that comes from? It comes from the man side of the Ten Commandments. Now, how many did, how many's listed? But there are six. There are not four. There are six under the man's side. You know the Ten Commandments? Four on God's side and six on man's side? He just mentioned four. What about the other two? Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He hasn't forgot. Listen to what he says. He says, and if there is any other commandment, that's taken the whole, of, that's taken the whole mosaic system. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know what that is? That's Leviticus 19.18, and that's the royal law of love that is fulfilled when Jesus... That, you know what the fulfillment of the royal law of love, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as You know what that is? It's John 3.16. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love says it a second time, love, the love that God had when he sent his son, the love the son had when he went to the cross for you and I, for, for our sins, this is the love that the new covenant sponsors. James gave a legal formula for the law of transgressor. Here is his law. Here is the formula. If you commit to live under the Mosaic law system and stumble in one Mosaic law, you're guilty of them all. Jude, the 24th chapter, uh, Jude, uh, verse 24, 25. Listen to it. And listen to what he says. God is able. He says he's going to say it twice. Listen to what he says. He said, God is able to keep you from stumbling, 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 and God is able to make you stand in the presence of his holiness, blameless and with great joy. I don't know, but how does your life stand up to that? God is able. It's not that you're able to do this, people. It's that God is able to do it in you. We call that grace. When God does this in you, we call that grace. God is able. God is able to keep you from stumbling. God is able. And how does that work? Works through the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. The moment you believe that Christ died on your cross for the sin, was buried and raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit took up residence inside your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and your body is no longer your own. You hear me, young people? Your body is no longer your own. Don't get arrogant with God. Don't get prideful with God. You, listen. Listen. You need to humble yourself. In verse 20, he says, your body has been bought by the blood of Christ, therefore your body is not your own. It is to glorify God. We, lived in, we live in some of the most corrupt thinking in the church in young people 30 and under. They think anything goes. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you what's going to go. Divine discipline is not going to be a good sight. Where you get the idea that you can do anything you want after Christ died for you to live the victorious life? What makes you think you're going to get away with anything? You, you parents need to hold your young people to the truth of the word of God. You need to tell them the truth. 
You need to tell them. Now, what they do with it is their business, but you need to look them in the eye and tell them the truth. Can we not tell people the truth today? The answer is no. I can tell you that. The answer is no. Woman called me the other day, what am I going to do, Ron? I said, well, I have to know what you're talking about. She says, I've got a young person who came back from college, called me up and wanted to know if they could bring a friend home, and I said, sure, so we cleaned up the spare bedroom. He walks in with a, with a sweetheart on his arm, and I said, well, good. Uh, let me take you your things and show you the room where you've been staying. He stepped in front of his mother and said, she'll be staying in my room with me. What do you think of that? So the mother said, let me see your left hand. Let me see your left hand. Guess what she was looking for? Huh? What do you think she was looking for? I want to see something on that finger. You think there was one on it? Not only is he disres disrespectful to his faith in Christ, he's disrespectful to his parents. I said, well, what would you do? She said, well, I, I guess I've cleaned up two rooms for nothing. Because you're not going to sleep in this house in the same room, in the same bed in my house. And she looked at her son and said, and you know that. I don't know what they taught you in college, but I can tell you one thing. If you don't sleep in separate rooms, there will be no money coming out of my pocket for the college you're going to if this is the way you behave. I couldn't high fire over the phone but I wanted to high fire and do a dance. Thank God we got somebody with integrity. She told him the absolute truth. She told him, I love you, but you guys aren't going to do that here. Not going to do it here. And I'm going to tell you, if this is the way you live, my money's not going to support it. God love her. I thought, boy, you must have come out of my generation. What's happened to us, people? What's happened to us? If you look at the news and you're sick of what you're seeing, look at yourself in the mirror. We're the culture that's created this mess. And we got the answer. Trump don't have the answer. The Congress doesn't have the answer. We have it. The church has the answer. Preach Jesus Christ and then live it. Is that too hard? Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hurting nation and tell young people the absolute truth. Because they're told in college there's no such thing as absolute truth. When your kids come home, just talk with them a while, and you'll find out. Spend some time with teenagers. Spend some time with young college kids, and you'll find it out. And we wonder why we've got a sick, anemic nation and church. Jeez. Listen, I can't... I, I don't have everybody that's willing to come to my church to hear this. People don't want to hear sin anymore. They don't want to hear this message. You're not going to come back. You're not going to come back. If you're playing with the sin parts of the world, you're not going to come back. You're not going to come back. You don't want to hear about sin. You don't want to hear about discipline. And therefore, you're not going to be able to give the love of Christ out because you're too, you're too involved in the love inwardly and not the love outwardly. You're not going to share the gospel with anybody. You got too much guilt. You know what does that? Sin. So James gives a legal formula. Jesus gives a practical application in the rich young ruler. Why don't you go to Luke with me? I'm going to take you to a practical application. I only got the first hour, so I got to get after it. I know I ran a little bit. Sometimes it's hunting season. I have to just chase the rabbit. Can't shoot long distance. I have to get close enough to get them. Here I am, Luke 18, the rich young ruler, verses 18. 
I don't know. I'm going all the way to 34, but we're, we're not going to read all that. You know the story of the rich young ruler? Here's what you miss. See, starting with verse 18, 18, that's the story of the rich young ruler. But here's what people miss. What led up to his question? Now, let's look at his question. A certain ruler, we call him the rich young ruler. A certain ruler questioned Jesus, questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He's interested in spiritually. Now, he grew up, he grew up in a Jewish, and listen, a, a very strong Orthodox Jewish home. He's going to tell you this. All through his growing up years, and now he's a full-grown adult, young, mature, graduate, successful, young adult. Listen to me. He's not saved. Went to the synagogue all of his life. Went through all of the children's training. Went through all of catechism, as they call it. He's not saved. And he comes to Jesus and wants to know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Where did the question come from? Did he just walk in off the street with a question? Look at verse 15. And people were bringing their babies to Jesus so that he might touch them. When the disciples saw it, they began rebuking Jesus and the people. They began to rebuke the people and Jesus for bringing children to Jesus. Jesus called them and said, permit children to come to me. Now listen to this. Because this is what an active, progressive church does. Goes after young families with children with an opportunity to train them up in the ways of the Lord. Permit children to come to me. This is for my son-in-law, Dave. Permit children to come to me. Do not hinder them. You know, one of the craziest things I found as a pastor, and I know Dave can... He goes with this. Parents, their child does something that has nothing to do with church. They discipline and won't come to church because the kids love church. They discipline. They, they kick the ball some way or another. They don't like it. The parents go, like, you're not going to church. And the kids cry and cry because they want to go to church. Who ever heard of such a thing? Do not do that, people. Do not do that. Why? Jesus said, don't permit them. Don't hinder them from coming to me. Permit children to come to me. Don't hinder them. Do not hinder them. For, watch this, and here's the reason, for the kingdom of God belongs to such people as these. Verse 17. Truly I say to you, that's a point of doctrine when you hear that, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. Are you with me? This young adult, Successful business Jew grew up in the synagogue catechismal teaching, never introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ, never introduced to the gospel that one day God would send his son into the world and he would become a suffering servant for the sins of the people. And the people were not ready so that when he came... John, the first chapter, 11 through 13 says, he came to his own, and his own received him not. And so the rich young ruler, having listened, curious to watch how he handled children, and he handled them wonderfully, he makes a comment about, do, do not stop parents from bringing these children and he teaches a lesson to all of us about how children receive Christ. And they do it in innocence and wonder. It is amazing to me to watch little children get saved. They don't have all the baggage of the youthful lust trends and all of the other stuff that people get as they go along the world's way. They're just innocent. And it's wonderful to see him get saved. And a church should be all about getting kids saved. That's what our camp does every year, what our educational program is all about. And so out of this lesson that Jesus gave about entering the kingdom like a child, 
it triggers a memory in the rich young ruler who grow up with that idea. But without a gospel, without a clear gospel. And he, he said, listen to me now, because Jesus is going to respond. Uh, there are three dialogues that go on in this story between Jesus and the rich young ruler that should not be missed. The rich young ruler says to him, good agathos daskalos, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Watch Jesus' answer. Watch Jesus, verse 19. Why do you call me good, Agathos? No one is Agathos except God alone. You see, that was a good question. Are you saying that I and God are inseparable? That, that I'm the son of God? If you are, we're, we're on a right path here. Are you interested in listening to me like a child? Huh? You know, you can tell a little child that. He don't fuss a bit about the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God. The Son of God who's come to die in your place for your sins to bring you to God the Father where he is your daddy. Like he's my daddy. Little kids get the daddy story. How wonderful that is. And then Jesus in verse 20 says, okay, let's talk business. Apparently, you're not calling me good because you think I'm God's son. You just think I'm a good teacher. That's a good point because it shows positive volition that they recognize Jesus is a good teacher of the word of God. Now, in the end, he's not going to buy in that he's even a good teacher because he's not going to obey it. Here's what Jesus told him. You know the commandments. Now, we'll find out if he does. Now, you know the commandments. Listen to what he says. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not honor your father and mother. Right out of Exodus 20, chapter verse 17, what did he miss? Oh, I know some of you know, but listen, how many, are, count them. Can you count, can you count to six? Anybody, anybody in here can't count to six? Okay, well, then count them. How many do I have? Count them! How many do I have? Five. But how many's in it? Six. So which one did he, listen, in case, which one did he miss? He missed one. Look, look, how are you going to know which one he missed? You'd have to go to Leviticus, the 20th chapter, verse 17. You'd have to go to Leviticus, the 20th chapter, verse 17. You'd have to look at them. There are six of them listed on the man's side of the Ten Commandments. He listed not only that, but I'll tell you something else he did. Are you looking at Leviticus? Are you looking at Exodus 20, 17? I'll tell you something else he did. He did what a good teacher does on a test. He mixed them up. See, we memorize them in order. When he went, when he went to catechism, he learned them in order. Out of your father and mother. He learned them in order. But Jesus went and mixed them all up. Right? And, well, look, if you've compared the two, right? Have you compared the two? He mixed them up. And he left one out. He mixed them up and left one out. Which one did he leave out? Covet, right? Do you know, not one time, that, that, that's the one thing he lacks. Not one time is this ever said between the rich young ruler and Jesus, and yet it was the one. Not one time did Jesus point it out. Not one time did he say, which one did you miss, hot shot? Because no doubt the rich young ruler was the brightest student in the class when he was going through. He didn't say, well, hot shot, which one did you miss? He didn't do that. He never mentioned it. Never mentioned it. 
Not one time in this story does he mention covetousness. Not one time. And so, listen, what now dialogue two. That's dialogue one. Here's dialogue two, verse 21. And the rich young ruler responded, all these things I have kept from my youth. Is that true? Listen, listen, be a counselor now with me. Is that true? Has he kept all of them? He didn't say to Jesus, well, hey, you missed one. Actually, there are six. He didn't say it. Jesus never mentioned it. He turns around and said, well, I've kept all these from my youth. That's how we know he went through the whole catechism system of the Mosaic Law. He tells us ourself, I, I studied these. I know these frontwards and backwards. Oh, really? I did them frontwards and backwards, and you didn't. But why did he, why did he leave out covetousness? Listen to Jesus' response to his question, to his answer, all things I have kept from you. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. What's the one thing? He never does says, he never says covet. You lack covet because you're engaged in it. He says one thing you still lack. Now, here's what he does. He gives them a practical application of covetousness. A practical application of covetousness. He shows him how he violates this law. And if you violate one, you violate them all. Now look, it's going to be, he's going to be hard-pressed to believe that he, if he's guilty of covetousness, he's guilty of murder, right? Adultery, stealing. But see, that's the formula of the law. So Jesus says, one thing you still lack, here's the practical application, Sell all that you possess, distribute it to the poor, and he gives them a promise. Do you see the promise? What promise does he give them? Watch, he gives them a promise. If you will do this, I will do this. If you do that, I will do this. Here's what he says. You shall have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Look. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, here's what he says about treasure. He says, where your treasure is, your what is? Where your treasure is what? So be careful. Be careful where you put your heart. Because that's where your treasure is. That's what you treasure the most. Be careful where you put your heart. Right? I mean, what, what's the bottom line of this Matthew 6? Do you understand? And you shall have, listen, don't lay up store for your treasures on earth where you only live a short time. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where you live forever. Does that make, make sense to you? Listen, everything you store here can be taken from you, Jesus says in Matthew 6, but everything you lay up there can never be taken from you. Never in time nor eternity. Where do you think you're going to spend the most time, on earth or in heaven? <laughs> Come on now. And get, who lays up treasures for you? Who lays them up? You lay up treasures for yourself. You can lay them up on earth and you can lay them up in heaven. I'm not saying you shouldn't have treasures on earth. It shouldn't be the only place you got treasure. He tells him, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and you will have, I will see to it, son, that you will have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. Offers to give him a job. He's out recruiting. Offers him a job. Nobody would take the job Jesus gives you because all the treasures are in heaven. They're not on earth. <laughs> you know that? I knew it when I went into ministry. I knew it absolutely. If you're going into ministry, Ronnie, to build up treasures on earth, you've picked the wrong place. And I still went. 
And I don't regret a moment of it. I would do it all over again because I was overwhelmed by what Christ had done for me when he would die on the cross to take care of my sin issue. And, and, he, and he would, what a privilege when I felt called into the ministry. What an honor I felt. I feel it to this very day. There is no job I'd rather have than to follow Jesus Christ. And the fact that he would ask me to come and follow him was the highest of calls I could ever imagine in my life. And to this day, I've never thought about treasures one place or the other. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about treasures in heaven, although I know they're going. <laughs> I don't think about a big bank account either place. I just know I'd rather send them there than send them here because here they, they're only temporary. Rob, must, roll, I don't know, mold, all that, thieves, rust, you know. They went through a list. Just watch, watch the stock market it would be enough to drive you nuts. So we've gone through this whole thing. See, this has rung a bell in this young guy's life. Mixed them all up. Mixed them all up. Now, all these things he says I've kept. You know what I liked what Jesus said? Jesus said, he, he he says, I know, here's what he says when he says, you know the commandments. He said, I know you're a bright guy. I know you've been, you've gone through all your catechismal teaching. Unfortunately, they never taught you about Christ. Isn't that sad to go to church and grow up and never told the importance of the gospel of Christ? That was his case. It was true of Saul of Tarsus. It was true of Peter. It was true of all these guys. You do know that, don't you? You know what he had? He had ritual without reality. He had form without substance. He had missed completely in his whole teaching from a little kid all up to a grown person. He had missed Hebrews 10.1. That shadow Christology points you to Christ who fulfills it in your life. And so here was the third response, verse 23. Here's the third response. And when he had heard these things about treasure, sell, listen what he heard, sell, distribute, and I think he probably shut down, you'll have treasures in heaven. The sell and distribute, give it all away because your focus will be, should be on treasures in heaven. It just shut, he just shut down. And so Jesus, when Jesus heard, when Jesus heard this, and he said one thing, oh, verse 23, and when the rich young ruler had heard these things, he became very sad. You know how Jesus, listen, he never said another word to Jesus at this point. You know, how did, listen, Jesus saw the sadness in his eyes. Body language, we call it. Listen to what Jesus, listen. Jesus, it says he was very sad because he was extremely rich. Jesus looked at him. Look, let, let me tell you what Jesus did. What does a person do when they're sad and guilty? What does a child do? Puts his eyes anywhere else but on you. <laughs> what? And what does a parent do if they want to communicate? They say, son, you got to look up here. Daughter, you've got to look, look up here. Look at, look at that, look at daddy, look at mama, right? Am I the only person that knows you have to have eye contact to get through? And if they don't, you have a little patience and you kind of just lift their little head up. Look at me. Let's talk about this. It's exactly what Jesus is doing. It's exactly what Jesus is doing. Because listen, when it says, and Jesus looked at him, means he looked him right in the eye. But this has got to be a moment of reality. You and I have got to come to some place right here because today is the day of salvation. Now is the moment. Now is the moment. Now is the moment. Listen. Do you know why you're here today? Have you figured it out yet? 
If you think it's for something after church, it isn't. Because you could come after church. <laughs> now I'm asking you why you came today. You say, I don't know. Maybe like the rich young ruler, you didn't know. But I'm going to tell you, by now in this service, you know. God has thundered in your soul things that you need to deal with. Let me ask you this. Is one of them salvation? Let me tell you. Christ dies on the cross for your sins, for yours and mine. He is buried on the third day, raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. If you believe it, you're saved. Listen to what Romans 1.16 says. It says the gospel, which I just explained. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power. You can't save yourself. You're not expected to save yourself. You're, you're expected to believe that Jesus can save you. Therefore, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, Now you understand that you're saved by faith through grace and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Listen. You've hid too long for making a decision here. You've hid too long. And what God has done is brought you out, out of the closet and into this congregation this morning to tell you that. Do you know that? Do you know that he brought you this way today to tell you, do you understand the agony of the death of Christ to take you out of sin and you shouldn't be playing in it? Sin is not the arena for the Christian life. It's not how you promote Christ. It's not how you live a healthy spiritual life. It is not the way to go. Do you know that? Listen, I may speak loud. I may speak rough sometimes, but I speak the truth and I love you. I love you. The path you're on is a path to destruction. It will not give you what you want in time nor eternity. Follow it no longer. Make changes in your life starting now. Make changes. Settle in your heart the things that you know are right and commit yourself to those things that you know are right. And if other people don't want to go along with you, move on. Because Christ will never leave you nor forsake you and everybody else will. Everybody else will leave you except for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you so that he would never leave you when you do the right thing. He will support you. He will honor you. He will do everything in his godly power to bring you to a place of great peace and prosperity in your life by grace. You need to hear him say, I have treasures for you in heaven. The whole program on earth is to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. It's not treasures on earth. You can have them both but not without the exclusion of one from the other. The rich young ruler made a choice that day. I'll keep my treasures on earth. I don't care about the treasures in heaven. The audience responded. Listen, the audience jumped into this thing in my closing remarks. I'm going to skip what Peter said. Let's see. Look at verse 26. There's an audience, there's a group of people around him listening to this conversation that brought their children. The people that brought the children and the crowd that gathered to watch Jesus deal with children. And then the rich young ruler brought up a question. Look at verse 26. And they who heard it said, then who can be saved? See, they understood when the rich young ruler talked to them. They understood what Jesus said. You can only enter the kingdom of God as a little child's faith. And they heard the rich young ruler say, how can I inherit eternal life? They listened to what Jesus said, and they said, this sounds mo mostly impossible. Then how can anybody be? You see, they, listen to me, they 
They followed the dots. They connected the dots, didn't they? The audience, maybe more than you, because you're not focused on me, maybe more than you, they connected the dots. And so they ask, in verse 26, then who can be saved? Listen to what he said. The things impossible with men, which the rich young ruler was into, keeping the law, which can only condemn you. The things that are impossible with men, talking about salvation, are possible with God. That's why you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. All right? Don't walk out without a gift. Every person in this room, God has brought you. Walk out with a gift. If you've never been saved, then listen. Today, when we bow our head, you commit to God. I believe Jesus came and died for my sins. You tell God, I believe you raised him from a dead. I believe that I want to be saved today. And I commit myself to it. I believe it. And you'll be saved when you walk out of here by the authority of the word of God. Romans 1.16. And if you brought in sin into this congregation today and said, I'm going to live it the way I want to live it, you cannot live the way you want to live it because you've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and God will not permit it. And he will discipline you. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Your life is no longer your own when you came to be saved, to go to heaven when you die. I'm trying to spare you. Stop running the way of the world. Run the way with Christ. Christ says to you today, come follow me. Come follow me. Now, I'm not going to give a come forward off invitation today. But I'm going to tell you something. The walk he wants you to really have in your life is when you walk out, not when you walk forward. I call you to commit yourself today to follow Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost is to you personally. Because you have no way to compare it to the cost that it cost God to give you the privilege. And what I'm asking you to do today after a word of prayer and the offering, and you leave for the first half, and then Ernie comes the second half to give you a break. I want the commitment to come from your heart when you walk out, not when you walk forward, when you walk out. Don't do what the rich young ruler did. He walked away very sad. He should have walked, walked away very glad. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way. We got to quit playing these foolish games. Souls are perishing around us and we don't care. We're so self-struck of importance to ourselves and our ambitions that we forgot we're to lay up treasures in heaven along with our journey on earth. It's never too late. Never too late. If we're breathing, God has a plan, and we're part of it. We need to institute that plan in our life starting today. When we walk out of this service today, when we walk out, May we be committed to change. Live in such a way if Christ was part of our household, he would be pleased in the way we behave. Not because we're legalistic. Not because we think that we can just rebound and be okay. Just because we can confess sin. No, no. Because we're committed in our heart to live an honorable life with integrity before God Almighty. For the cost, it cost him to give us the privilege to be saved. 
secured, sealed into the day of redemption. Bless, Father, this offering that's about to be taken and motivate his Father to reach as many as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this offering. We thank you for every person that's put every penny in it. But it's never the amount that's important. It's the motive. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.